Peace and all good. Welcome uh, to all of you to this uh, a series of webinars organized by a uh, Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Office of Franciscan Order um, in Rome. And um, this particular webinar uh, is entitled um, Migration, a crisis and the call to solidarity in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have a, a very a diverse group of uh, panelists. Um, each one of them um, will, uh, will present uh, for about 10 minutes or so, and then we are going to have some time for, uh, for Q&A. Um, also, I, I would like to uh, mention that um, our uh, Franciscan network on migration has also been involved in, uh, in this webinar. Um, well, before I introduce the panelists, I would like uh, to uh, offer some, uh, to offer a prayer. So let us place ourselves in the presence of God. O oh, loving God, as we gather in the name of your son Jesus, our brother and savior, we celebrate his ascension to heaven. We remember that we too, with the poor and marginalized of this world, are destined to share body and soul in the fullness of life of God. Thank you for joining us together to, the, to this Zoom conference from across different parts of the world. You who call us to hear the cry of the poor, the migrants, the clamor of our mother sister earth, guide us, inform us, inspire us. May your Holy Spirit of wisdom, intelligence, and creativity be with us. Help us to begin to entangle and deal with the complex systemic causes of racial and economic inequality that wreaks havoc upon the lives of millions of migrants and refugees from around the world. You have told us that you are going to be with us always as the one who serves. May we never doubt your promise. Your Holy Spirit, as Pope Francis reminds us in Laudato Si, has filled the universe with possibilities and that from the very heart of things, something new can always emerge. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the panelists. The first panelist is uh, Father Julian Jagudia, uh, the friar of Holy Name Province, uh, who is also a director of the Migrant Center um, in New York City. Uh, the second uh, panelist is um, Reverend Antonio Ablon, uh, a bishop, um, he is um, a very impressive, uh, uh, an amazing um, uh, activist for, for justice in the Philippines. Now he, currently he's in Germany as a guest of the Hamburg Foundation for Politically Persecuted Person. He left Philippines uh, after being heavily attacked by the state through red tagging and vilification. Uh, his name was painted on the streets, uh, highways, walls, bridges, and other public edifices, uh, equating him and branding him as part of the uh, guerrilla New People's Army when he only ministered to indigenous people and marginalized and victims of human rights uh, violations. And um, so we are thrilled to have him with us. And also, um, on this uh, webinar, we have brother, uh, Father Angelito Cortez, um, JPAC coordinator for the East Asian Conference, and also my co-animator uh, for J uh, JPAC um, of the Franciscan Order. So, so welcome to you all. And I would like to first ask uh, Father Julian Jagudilla to uh, to begin his presentation. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, good morning, especially to our immigrant uh, sisters and brothers. 
and good morning to all who champion the rights and welfare of all immigrants. Uh, my presentation is on how uh, COVID-19 and earth racial disparity and displays undocumented immigrants in the U.S. To uh, put a context to my presentation, let us just uh, have a slide here that is on March 13th, uh, President Trump uh, declared a national state of emergency due to the coronavirus. Uh, Washington Post notes that uh, the president was informed of the virus way back early in this year, sometime in January and February, during his uh, daily uh, president's briefing. But he continued to downplay the outbreak to the public. I want to call your attention to the data here. That is on March 13th, when the president uh, announced a state of emergency, there were only 277 confirmed cases in the US and seven deaths. This morning, I checked the data. There are 1,500,000 plus confirmed cases and 90,000 plus deaths in the US. And below there, you will see the five states, five major states that was uh, hit heavily by the coronavirus. Okay. I'd like to highlight also that uh, this pandemic uh, heavily affected uh, colored people, particularly African Americans and Latinos. As you can see here in New York, uh, the data shows that uh, the number is on the rise, as well as in other states like Louisiana, Michigan, and Illinois. And it brings us to the question, what, uh, what causes this effect of uh, the, the, the pandemic on African American and Latino population? It is found out that uh, the African American population suffer from um, underlying conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and other um, illness. And also there is a perceived um, uh, racism towards the um, African American uh, population. It is said that um, Kaiser uh, Health News um, reported that African American patients enter the healthcare system with distinct disadvantages. There is less access to quality healthcare in many black communities. Uh, research shows and black people are more likely to suffer from diabetes, hypertension, and other underlying conditions. Uh, the research shows that the decision a result of ingrained assumptions, cultural ignorance, and hostile attitude toward African Americans. And this trend, trend rather, is playing out across the country. Now let's hear from uh, the voices on the ground uh, with our Latino brothers and sisters. Places, unemployment and underemployment is rampant in the immigrant community where they work mainly in service sector jobs and have either lost their jobs or have been told to stay home. The now exposed racial inequalities in our economy, housing and healthcare systems are up front and center in the fight for social justice and the true need for compassion. On the ground here in Queens, the migrant community has had to find sustenance in food pantries, such as La Jornada in Flushing, Queens, where they wait on long lines to receive shopping bags of food to sustain their families, while they live in a state of insecurity, wondering how they will pay their rent come June 1st, and how to social distance if a family member should become ill in their less than spacious home. Elmhurst Hospital. Eh, buena 
gracias a todos este, los que vean este video, especialmente pues, a los frailes y a todas aquellas organizaciones que, que están eh, de una u otra manera pues, eh, viendo cómo están nuestras comunidades. Eh, mi nombre es Alex Grande y, y trabajo más que todo en el área del Angli Park. Y es triste todo lo que estamos viviendo a raíz de esta pandemia, esta enfermedad que se está dando hoy en día, ya que en nuestra comunidad es una comunidad muy marginal, todos somos emigrantes, la gran mayoría es de Guatemala y de El Salvador, y muchos eh, nos hemos quedado sin trabajo, eh, hay muchas personas que por temor a, a no tener documentos no se han ido a los hospitales y están enfermas y están sufriendo en sus casas. Y de una u otra manera, pues, este... Tratamos como grupos, como ministerios de la iglesia, ayudar ¿verdad? a estas comunidades, a estos hermanos nuestros que están pasando estos momentos difíciles, ¿verdad? ya que les, les decía de que por alguna razón ellos no visitan los hospitales, ¿verdad? porque no hay documentos y, y hay miedo dentro de la comunidad. Así es que si alguien pues, puede ayudar a nuestra comunidad, eh, estamos en, en Langley Park y somos una comunidad totalmente inmigrante, ¿verdad? con mucha necesidad y esperamos pues el apoyo de, de quienes estén viendo pues, este video. Agradecemos a nuestra parroquia que siempre ha luchado por nosotros y está haciendo todo lo posible para que en nuestra comunidad siempre tenga eh, lo necesario, lo básico para seguir adelante. Eh, los padres de San Camilo siempre han estado con nosotros a la orden y les agradecemos de todo corazón. Que el Señor los bendiga y cuídense mucho. Ok, thank you. Thank you. And um, now... And, and uh, I would like to highlight also that uh, a big number of our Latino brothers and sisters are working as uh, frontline workers, as essential workers. And... Uh, Major factors that affect or that impact the Latino community are primarily uh, poverty, uh, testing and healthcare, uh, jobs that they held in the front lines, and inability to social distance and their living condition. I would like to highlight also that among this um, affected population, are the undocumented immigrants are displaced and most vulnerable. Uh, it be, it's because the, with the clo closing of businesses, they lost their jobs and they did not benefit from the CARES Act. Uh, there are 5.5 uh, million undocumented immigrants in the U.S. And when we talk about undocumented immigrants, we consider them as the hard to count population. And any representation or any data that represents the undocumented population are just but estimates. Going further, uh, ICE arrest and detention uh, and deportation uh, continue, even in the midst of this crisis. And nowadays, uh, the government is trying to, or is aggressively deporting uh, children back to their home countries. Um, with the, the closing of the border, uh, many of the migrants are uh, stacked at the US-Mexican uh, US border. And there are documented cases of murder, rape, and extortion. And because of the border they're closing, uh, many of these immigrants will be victimized by coyotes. And hopefully, and lastly, and finally, but brother, uh, I hopefully that our call to act to solidarity will lead towards uh, global action. Thank you, Yatsi. Um, thank you, Julian. And now I would like to invite um, uh, Bishop Antonio Ablon, a great champion on human rights in the Philippines. Thank you for the <clears throat> invitation. I am speaking in behalf of the April 28th Coalition for Migrants and Refugees' Rights and Welfare. Let me begin with a quote in the article of Matteo De Bellis, Amnesty International's migration researcher. And I quote, on 28th April, residents and carers at Surrey Hills Care Home in the United Kingdom stood silent in tribute to Larnie Soniga, a victim of COVID-19, 
who had died four days earlier. The 54-year-old Soniga has just become a British citizen, 12 years after moving from the Philippines. After years of waiting, his wife was finally receiving the documents to reunite with him. She would have arrived in June had COVID-19 not arrived first. This tragedy and countless others are exposing not only the enormous suffering that COVID-19 can generate, but also how skewed the building blocks of our society are. Where people carrying out essential work, caring for, for the elderly or children, building roads, delivering food, picking fruits, and shocking, stocking shelves are invariably among the lowest paid and very often have a migrant background. These people do not have the luxury of working from home. And as a result, they are more easily exposed to the virus and COVID. Migrants and immigrants share the commonality on the root cause of migration. Migration now becomes a forced choice if we still can consider it a choice for people to earn for a living and conserve the dignity as a person. They left and migrated because of wars of aggression in their homeland. They flee from environmentally torn countries caused by multinational mining and exploitation from despotic and tyrannical rule. The labor export policy have made Filipinos, for example, a mere product, a simple commodity on which to exchange and profit from. In 2019 alone, the government in the Philippines had profited an enormous $29 billion from the remittances of OFWs. More than 10% of the total population of Filipinos are dis dispersed globally. Before the pandemic, 7,000 Filipinos leave the country every day to work abroad. According to Migrante Europe, the situation of undocumented migrants and refugees here in Europe are precarious hunger and possible homelessness because they can't pay the rent. Many undocumented Filipinos who are suffering from hunger are in those countries with total lockdown where they need to produce and show documents proving that they have to go to work. They are in Greece, Belgium, France, Italy, Spain, Hungary, United Kingdom, and etc. Most of them are daily wage earners. Some countries like Netherlands, Belgium, etc. suspended services for refugees to apply for asylum. Hungary closed its borders to all refugees. In Greece, according to Matteo de Bellis, thousands of people are trapped in unrelentingly harsh conditions, courtesy of Europe's containment policy. Imagine being among 34,000 asylum seekers, including older people, pregnant women, and children confined in camps on Greek islands, which have capacity of only 6,000. Evidently, Greek authorities should transfer asylum seekers to the mainland, and other European Union countries should offer places for relocation. In Germany, according to news on portal DW, there are about one and a half million refugees in Germany. Many live in centers with several hundred inhabitants. Conditions are cramped and in some cases, residents share dormitories with strangers. At the moment, the fact that people have to share bathrooms and kitchens is exacerbating the situation and making contagion all the more likely and will end up effect infecting each other and that quarantine will simply be extended week by week. From Reddish online media, Red Peace, Romanian seasonal workers in Germany have gone to strike against exploitation and are demanding full rights as they work in the fields during asparagus harvesting season. They are flown in to harvest Germany's vegetables but paid ultra low wages, given moldy food to subsist on, provided with bad accommodation and get no protection from COVID-19. And on top of that, they are not being paid well, earning only 100 to 250 euros for a month. About 300,000 seasonal workers came to Germany every year to work in fields and live in disparate conditions, mostly isolated from the outside world. In Italy, a law 
to grant temporary regularization on migrants is approved by the parliament like it is in Portugal. However, in our discussions with Filipinos and among members of the coalition, Father Aris Miranda of the Promotion of Church People's Response in Europe shared the following initial critical analysis. One, what does the law provide? It provides regularization of irregular migrants, particularly those in the agricultural and domestic help workers. There are around 600,000 irregulars in Italy, and more than 60% are from the agricultural sector. According to the government, the motive is to make the invisible visible and protect their rights, but there is a lot of doubts in this. In fact, several migrant organizations and organize, are organizing protest rallies against this new decree. Two, what is something wrong in this law? It does not apply to all irregulars and clandestine, but for those who entered legally in Italy, but were not able to renew their permit to stay or labor contract and work in black labor. It is not free. Applicants have to pay 400 euros and not spared from the government's hunger to repeal their bankruptcy at the price of the blood of the irregulars. It is another form of state exaction. It is temporary, and when it expires, no one knows what will happen to them. They said that anyone who has temporary labor contract can transform it into a regular contract. But knowing the very bu bureaucratic process in Italy, it will not be granted easily. There is nothing new in this law. It is technically a recycling of the old and inutile law, the Decreto Plosi, a law which provides migrants who want to work in Italy to apply online, but very few were admitted and some has to wait for years as it has an annual quota. It is another form of state exaction. Indeed, COVID-19 pandemic respects no national boundary, ethnicity, eco-social, or immigration status and has aggravated the plight of the poor who are the real victims in Europe like many other countries in the world. However advanced the economy are, the real victims and most vulnerable are the undocumented immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced peoples. It was along this very worrisome and horrible situation that the April 28 coalition was founded less than a month ago, composed of more than 70 organizations now all over Europe. It is a Europe-wide formation of grassroots organizations and concerned individuals for migrants and refugees' rights and welfare united by our common objectives and shared values that all people have the right for equal protection in this continent and around the globe. We organize ourselves to help address root causes of forced migration due to poverty, wars, climate crisis, and other regional issues, and realizing recently the damaging impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic on migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced peoples we call on our host countries in Europe, one, to legislate the regularization and grant full citizenship rights for all migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and displaced people. Two, ensure the provision of health assistance and social services regardless of immigration status and address homelessness and food insecurity. Three, stop the immigration detention and deportation of individuals and families. Four, and the global inequalities within and among nations. Lastly, we are also calling the international community, the nations and states, especially the members of the United Nations. And I want to quote the very letter of the challenge posted in the UN for Migration and Refugees. It says, and I quote, member states are acutely, acutely aware of the huge movement of people across borders. Migration is a natural feature of our humanity, presenting opportunities but also challenges and vulnerabilities that we are struggling to address. And we need to cooperate better, assist and protect the over 25 million refugees who have been forced to leave their countries and to support host countries and communities. The General Assembly should continue to promote the two recent milestone agreements one, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And two, the Global Compact on Refugees aimed to provide coherence to the global efforts 
required for safe, orderly, and regular migration, as well as to ensure the protection and assistance of the refugees around the world. To end with, um, may I uh, request that uh, our video presentation may be uh, played. Uh, my name is Musa Sangari. I am the president of the Ivorian community of Tunis. I am also the vice president of the coronavirus in this pandemic. It was a disaster everywhere in the world because a lot of members of the community that are refugees, migrants, uh, asylum seekers, they do not have a job, so they stop uh, working. There was a boom and they did not have nothing to do. So we as a community, we try to see our partner, many partners try to help us with the voucher, with the, the food, so we distribute with the community, with the family, uh, with the child. It was very, very difficult, but uh, we try to manage the situation. Uh, now, uh, thanks are done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bishop. And now I would like to invite Brother Angelito Cortez to follow with his presentation. Greetings of peace and solidarity to all our participants and to all migrants in the world. And uh, as a Filipino, uh, I come with the millions of overseas Filipino workers around the globe. And uh, let me begin my presentation with uh, a video capsulizing our topic for this morning. I'm Errol Yamake, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Project on Prosperity and Development. COVID-19 has changed much about how we live. In the short term, over 170 countries have restricted travel, but the pandemic could also be fundamentally changing the long-term face of global migration. Let's consider five plausible scenarios. First, migrant labor, long the engine of a globalized economy, stops moving. Long disruptions reorient agricultural production. Layoffs target jobs previously filled by migrants. The inability of labor to move impacts global economic output and puts migrant families at greater risk. Second, global inequality increases. Remittances dry up. Low-skilled migrants, like low-income people, physically go to work, putting them at risk of contracting and spreading the virus. This in turn leads to an increase in xenophobia towards migrants. Third, temporary migration restrictions become permanent or at least long-lasting. Authoritarian, anti-migrant leaders manufacture crisis after crisis to keep borders closed. Fourth, refugees, internally displaced persons, and other vulnerable people are unable to get out of harm's way. Many of these people also live in crowded places with little access to proper sanitation, putting them at greater risk of contracting and spreading the virus. Fifth, migration goes into the shadows. All of the scenarios I've just discussed would increase desperation at a time when fewer migration pathways exist. Those forced to move do so using smugglers, traffickers, and other illicit groups. This list is not comprehensive, nor are solutions easy, but we must be thinking about the longer term implications when designing short term restrictions. Not doing so could lead to the face of global migration being changed forever. We just heard the context of migration 
globally. But when we speak about migration, we also speak from the countries who are giving, sharing the resources. And I believe that as a Filipino, we are contributing a lot of uh, workers around the globe. As I read an article in The D Diplomat written by Mary Manlangit, the OFW or the Overseas Filipino Workers are the hurting heroes during this pandemic. With exemption on flight carrying medical supplies and other essential airlift operation, the Philippine government imposed a moratorium on flights for a week that started May 3 in a letter from the COVID-19 National Task Force chief addressed to the Transport Secretary the decision was in view of the need to ramp up the capacity of the country's system to properly process the growing number of Filipino repatriates coming back to the Philippines. As of May 6, the total number of Filipinos repatriated by the Southeast Asian government had reached 23,000, many of whom were overseas Filipino workers who had lost their jobs due to this pandemic. The Philippines is one of the largest diaspora in the world. There is an estimated 10 million Filipinos abroad, roughly a tenth of the country's population, working for the promise of higher wages and better opportunities for themselves and for their families back home. In 2019, remittances from these Filipino workers reached a record of high of $33.9 billion, equivalent to about 10% of the country's gross domestic product. With the ongoing global health crisis, how can a country in which 12% of households are OFW dependent be able to cushion the imminent economic threat? On May 6, the COVID-19 National Task Force informed the Filipino public that another 45,000 workers abroad are expected to return home by the end of June, bringing the list of repatriates close to 70,000. Said figures are even conservative as the medium and long-term effects have not been taken into account. As admitted by the National Chief of Workers in the Philippines, a policy brief authored by a top Filipino university that about 300,000 to 400,000 Filipino workers are estimated to be affected by the pandemic. From pay cuts to layoffs to, to eventual repatriation, a better quality of life overseas, particularly in developed countries, has been the pulling factor why Filipino workers pack their bags and go back to their own homes. In fact, it is becoming pervasive among the Filipino youth. According to the 2019 report of the World Economic Forum, about 53% of the country's young people aged 15 to 35 years old wanted to work overseas. In the Philippines, the acronym OFW or Over Fili Overseas Filipino Worker is synonymous to the modern day heroes, particularly attributed to their contribution to the country's economy despite personal sacrifices. While the 2008 financial crisis may have faltered remittances in flows from most affected countries into the Philippines, the economic risk that COVID-19 is generating more complicated as the pandemic is penetrating in all corners of the world. More so, fall, falling oil prices in the Middle East, the top destination of Filipino workers, has exacerbated the ordeal. In the middle of the Philippine government's implementation of modified lockdown throughout the countries lie looming impact of COVID-19 on its labor migration. Policymakers need not only to innovate with the economic loss from disturbed cash inflows, but also to instigate a best situation strategy to reintegrate repatriated workers in their home country, despite the increasing levels of unemployment and other socio-economic factors. In April, the Philippine government imposed a mandatory COVID-19 testing, a 14-day facility-based quarantine for all returning Filipinos, the testing in all related expense of OFWs, both land-based and sea-based migrants, are to be covered by the government. Non-OFWs, however, are to shoulder their accommodation costs. At present, the government, 110 
quarantine facilities in Metro Manila and nearby provinces while appealing for Filipino workers understanding over quarantine rules as some have aired on social media their disappointment on the lack of interagency organization. With all of these facts that is challenging our government and all the people hearing the situation, I think it's about time that we listen to the voices of these migrants abroad sacrificing for their families. Before I end my presentation, I would like to share a voice from the ground, a friend of mine, a young lawyer working for Filipino migrants. Can you please play the second video? Hi, everyone. I am Attorney Ernesto Bini. I am a director of a legal aid clinic here in the Philippines. Now, this pandemic upended daily life as we know it in uh, almost all countries in the world. So many sectors have been affected, as, as we already know. But in particular, there is a sector that has not been really talked about in the context of this global pandemic, and they are the OFWs, who are essentially Filipino citizens working abroad and thus subject to a different law, a different jurisdiction, and a different set of culture. And now in our analysis and survey, there, is a, there are like generally three areas of concern, legal concern, that the OFW is facing. The first one is the right to travel. The first victim, I guess, of rights in this pandemic is the right to travel. Though we understand that this right can be curtailed in the face of a health emergency, we still want to emphasize the obligation of the Philippine government, or in any government for that matter, to help facilitate the repatriations of OFWs who have lost their jobs back to the Philippines. This entails access to legal assistance in terms of document preparation, as well as assistance in the actual return and travel. Second is the issue of discrimination. I think this is common to all, especially those who, were, who are tested positive or those who have recovered from COVID-19. OFWs who have tested positive and those who have recovered still face discrimination in their communities. It is important that uh, laws, national or even in the local level, be enacted to punish uh, discriminatory acts as well as give support for those who are recovering or who are positive COVID-19. We should not forget that uh, they are sad. Uh, virus does not take away your human dignity. So uh, governments should ensure that the dignity of these individuals are still res respected. Third is the displacement of health. According to a news article, al almost close to 90,000 OFWs have been displaced worldwide amid the lockdowns brought by the pandemic. Um, the Department of Labor and Employment said in a statement last month, that there's a total of 89,436 OFWs from 40 Philippine overseas labor posts around the world were either displaced or now under a no work, no pay scheme. So it is essential that government should provide them support uh, in this period where they cannot get any other income in a different uh, land. And uh, lastly, there is a very peculiar case that happened in Taiwan uh, about an OFW who posted uh, her uh, dissent, her criticism to the Philippine government. And uh, news came out that a Philippine uh, official in Taiwan asked the Taiwanese government to expel her out of the country. And that was, of course, rejected by the Taiwanese government. But that's, that does give out a signal, gives us an idea of of uh, one of another victim of, of this pandemic is uh, free speech. And hopefully, this is an isolated case, but uh, it sends a chilling effect to other OFWs that they should not air out their grievances. That is uh, wrong because every person has an inherent right to express their thoughts, especially when it's uh, concerning public matters. So there you have. 
have it, guys. Uh, I hope that people continue to talk about these issues so both government and civil society would be pressured to act on this matter. Keep safe and have a good day. So amplifying those issues coming from the ground, I think the Philippines already harbored the reputation of being a resilient nation prior to, es to the escalation of the COVID-19 pandemic in domestic and global scenes. The country was already confounded by the erratic eruption on a, of an active volcano. And now as the typhoon season is launching, each citizen can only choose to be strong. Above the systemic government practices rise, the Filipino people who continue to depict such resilience in both home and abroad. As a Franciscan as, and as the Executive Secretary of the Association of Major Religious Affairs in the Philippines, as we work for Center for Migrants Concern and all the religious working and ministering to the OFW families here in the Philippines and abroad, we hear their cries, we hear their voices as we journey with them. And with this, I call for an international solidarity and I call that all the governments affect, affecting countries or having this issue of migration will listen, not only today, not only in this crisis of pandemic, but in the everyday simple lives of every migrants in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Angelito. And uh, once again, I would like to invite all the participants to, uh, to post uh, questions or comments to our distinguished panelists in the, in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, I would like to uh, ask uh, one of the panelists uh, to, um, I mean, you've mentioned about many different possible actions um, that could uh, move us towards a greater solidarity. Uh, certainly one is raising awareness of people about uh, how um, uh, the, the pandemic um, impacts the, the immigrants and refugees um, and um, also opportunities for for us as uh, members of the Franciscan family to to advocate uh, at the UN at our own respective governments uh, but what do you see as uh, opportunities for um, expanding this uh, this narrative uh, the narrative um, of, of xenophobia that also affects um, our own church um, um, so maybe if we could uh, address some of the uh, challenges uh, and opportunities, um, be it in the United States or Philippines, uh, many other countries where the immigrants uh, come, um, you know, there are a lot of Catholics. Um, what is it that we can um, help to kind of to, to influence and to uh, a narrative so that to counter those voices that, uh, that tell us to be afraid. So anyone would like to speak to that? How do we um, kind of broaden um, the-, the, the uh, Yes. Sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will speak uh, with my experience ministering the migrants' uh, family, especially those who are here in my country. Uh, usually in the Episcopal conferences, there is a desk for migrants. But typically we just celebrate the Migrant Sunday. But after Migrant Sunday, people are not aware of what is really happening about migration, the issues of migration, discrimination, human rights violations, trafficking, everything. But I think uh, in the church, there's an opportunity to encounter these people and consider them as part of the community 
not only declaring that they are uh, how do you call it? they are contributing to the economy but more so it's more on the opportunity to encounter and to journey uh, here in the Philippines we have a center for my migrants and these are uh, people who are coming from other countries and Filipinos are coming from abroad and going back. We, sh we usually have uh, not only Bible sharing, but formation, uh, storytelling, sharing, and they bring their family. We have, we're eating together, listening to their sentiments. I think it's a very good jump start to hear about their context. And as leaders of our own communities, we have that opportunity also to to organize these people. And when we organize them, we can develop people who will stand and lead them. And, you know, being instrument to, to collaborate with others. That's why when, when I'm talking to Julian, this will be an opportunity that the network in the Philippines will connect to the network in the United States, the network in Europe. So there will be a, a wider collaboration listening not only to their problems and sentiment, but also an opportunity of encounter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, There's a... Yes, yes, please. Um, for us, uh, working with uh, migrant organizations and uh, families here in Europe, there are, uh, I have listed four, uh, so we can, uh, one is uh, they have to come out and then, then speak up. Uh, especially the undocumented uh, migrants uh, in all uh, uh, nationalities. And then uh, it is good to be with other people. So uh, it is uh, advisable that uh, they should join organizations uh, of migrants in their own uh, countries or cities or localities. And then third would be they, have, they need to share their sufferings to the families and friends. I know some Filipinos are not even telling their families that they are sick because they are worried um, what will uh, their families uh, feel about them. Uh, but it is necessary that uh, we should tell our stories. Fourth, um, together with the organizations, we should engage other organizations and networks and governments. Um, like institutions, European Union, World Council of Churches, the United Nations, so that uh, together uh, they will hear our voices and uh, know our situations and uh, then uh, uh, challenge them to, to work for the rights and welfare of uh, migrants and refugees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh I think there's a call for uh, national and international uh, actions. That is to lobby uh, each and particular countries uh, hosting migrants and refugees, and also to bring to the attention of national bodies or organizations the plight of uh, migrants and refugees. And I think also uh, to give it a sharp, sharper focus is to address uh, the root, root causes of migration and displacement. You know, I think the basic question should be asked, and that is, why are people fleeing their home countries? And we all know that it is, you know, poverty and state-sponsored violence that dry, drove people uh, outside their home countries. And I also, I should say, for, for us, particularly here in the States, uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, issue has been very politicized. Meanwhile, people are dying and the politicians are still debating on what's the best solution. And I think for us people of faith, it is time for us to raise our voices, you know, uh, you know in defense of migrants and refugees, uh, to connect not only nationally, but also internationally, and organize and organize and organize. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Lourdes von Berg. There are a lot of Filipino truck drivers all over Europe, and according to Euronews, 
their working conditions and salary are not fair. What can we do to help? Anyone, perhaps uh, Bishop Ablon would like to address that? Yes, uh, we also monitored uh, these uh, truck uh, drivers and uh, they are really in a bad situation. They are uh, in fact sleeping in their own tracks and uh, make it like a home for them. So, uh, and not only truck drivers, we also have the seafarers whose, whose uh, stories are not open told um, because people, for example, in the Philippines are expecting that seafarers are uh, living uh, in good conditions with, with, with good salaries. Uh, in our, on our part, um, we are, because some of these uh, people, uh, because of course they are coming here to earn money because they cannot earn it in the Philippines, they just accept it as it is. What is the challenge for us is to, to, to educate them, to let them know that uh, yes, they're receiving salary, but it's meager. And uh, their employers or their companies are actually um, getting uh, higher money out of it. And that there are laws in, the, in European countries which are uh, not in favor of that, but because they are not uh, aware of it, so they just accept it. So the greater challenge is uh, uh, to look for them, and to talk to them and then organize them so they can have some powers uh, for vo to voice for in, in governments and in, the, in their employers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, Brother Angelito also would like to uh, speak to that, correct? Well, in my experience when I go to Europe, there, there's a strong solidarity movement of uh, workers, Come not only drivers, but even those who are working in the household. But uh, sometimes they, they don't have the time, they don't have, or they, they, their employers are not allowing them. But I agree with the bishop that we need to empower them to, to create spaces to give them opportunity to know one another and you know to to raise their sentiments their issues because usually if there's nobody guiding them there will, there will be no movement or group but if there's uh, like the chaplaincy for for migrants who will empower them or priests or pastors that will lead them then there will be a strong uh, movement that will really voice their, their, their issues and concerns. Okay, thank you. And if I may also, add. Uh, <laughs> there, are, uh, there are several other questions, so, um, and that we are running out of time. <laughs> um, first, uh, there was a comment by uh, Ras Testa um, suggesting that um, we could maybe figuring out a way to, to provide um, a, a forum for people from the marginalized community um, at the global level um, to provide short videos. And then maybe this, uh, our campaign, Laudato Si Revolution, which is also about um, a human ecology, uh, that, that could serve as a, as a forum to, to lift up their voices. Um, a question, for, a comment from uh, Kieran uh, Fitzsimmons uh, to the panelists. Um, rights in reported domestic uh, violence, particular vulnerability of sex workers, any comments, experiences, examples of pastoral support? Kieran OFM. Anyone? Any experience, um, examples of pastoral support for um, sex workers, domestic victims of domestic violence? Well, for the church, we have this Talita Home Network and it's organized by the UISG and USG. Uh, the Talita Home Network and Trafficking are working for this 
So they also work hand in hand with the migration ministry. But uh, with, with this situation, we also need preparations for people who will handle, like we need to disseminate uh, the right uh, issue. For example, if we need legal help, we need lawyers. If we need uh, pe uh, people who will handle the situation, then go to psychologists to, to, to have the briefing. So what I'm trying to say is we need uh, a lot of loop of different expertise so we can respond to to this uh, imperatives of this kind of ministry. Thank you, Angelino. Uh, there is a question by <clears throat> from uh, Marvir Montebon. Um, is there a support um, alternative jobs, for instance, from the Franciscan Church for migrants in the U.S. and Europe who lost their jobs due to the due to pandemic? Um, um, Julian would like to speak to it. Uh, for the Franciscans in in uh, in the East Coast, um, where I am belonging, where I belong in Yatsik, uh, we launched the Franciscan Relief Fund. That is, uh, we issued a hundred dollars grocery gift card to uh, uh, um, immigrants, especially undocumented, who lost their jobs. That is only one example of direct service and direct support to uh, the immigrant community. The state and city government, they have their own uh, forms of helping uh, uh, immigrants who lost their jobs. But nationally, in, in, in here in the U.S., uh, there, there is, you know, more or less no alternative jobs. There have been more than 30 million America, Americans have applied for unemployment. And about 36 million lost their jobs. So... Uh, competition for jobs really very tough. Uh, I just want to mention also regarding uh, domestic violence because of the sheltering in place or a stay uh, at home uh, policy of the government, uh, there are reported, uh, reported increase of uh, domestic violent, uh, violence cases here in the States. Uh -huh. So um, we'll be, this is the last question that we have. Um, uh, from John Mark Yanes um, about um, can how can overseas chaplains of migrant communities or congregations be involved uh, to help the plight of migrants not only through praying but also through social ministries and advocacy work which all of the panelists have mentioned yeah um as I uh, uh, said a while ago, um, it is a challenging uh, situation for pastors and uh, chaplains because, uh, uh, for example, Filipinos are uh, not uh, very open uh, telling their stories. Um, but we, we, we advise that uh, uh, we, we try our best. Uh, for example, we here in uh, Hamburg, uh, uh, some pastors are already uh, preparing for some counseling sessions and um, may it be physical or um, uh, um, by phone or, or whatever means. Uh, but, but I think the challenge remains uh, that one, uh, we are not very much... Uh, um, we are not easy to, to, to reach out. Uh, for example, for myself, uh, so we, 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 we cannot just come to them and tell them what to do. Uh, but the challenge is, I think we should announce and inform people that uh, the churches or the church uh, religious uh, leaders are uh, open to this kind of situation. We are here that they can... Uh, uh, come and talk to uh, about their problems, and then uh, for the church people to to uh, make ourselves available and the institution available for all these uh, kind of uh, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes. we, to, we are coming to the end of um, of this of this webinar, and we've heard. 
um, not only um, the reports from the ground, uh, but also a very resounding call to uh, to solidarity, solidarity in in accompanying people through very specific um, actions um, that could alleviate their uh, their plight through through advocacy at various levels, the government, local government, uh, UN, but also um, what I've heard very clearly was uh, the call for us, a challenge for Franciscans especially, to help um, empower people to tell their stories. Uh, and we as Franciscans, this is part of our charism, no? Um, so there's a lot to do. There's so many different opportunities. I would like to um, invite uh, the, the listeners to avail themselves of the resources that soon will be available through the Franciscan Laudato Si Revolution. Um, and that could be a very powerful way for us to, to weave in those concerns about the systemic causes of injustice um, and inequalities, uh, the, the, how, how the, the pandemic exacerbates uh, those uh, as part of the, uh, our Franciscan engagement in Laudato Si uh, revolution. So once again, I would like to thank all of the panelists um, and uh, there is much more work to be done. And uh, thank you for all the participants. Um, and we'll be, uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, God bless, peace and all good. Peace. Thank you, peace. Thank you.